My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I've spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD Podcast. Today is a special day. It's the first time ever actually in studio we have someone. Now I say it every week, but we actually have another person in the studio with us today. It's Benito Olson. He attended Recruit Training Command in Chicago, Illinois, where he went on to attend Master at Arms A School on Naval Amphibious Base Little Creek, Virginia Beach, Virginia. From Little Creek, he selected his first tour in Bahrain, located on the Arabian Peninsula. Following his successful completion of Military Working Dog Handlers course, he reported back to Naval Support Activity Bahrain for an additional two years where he served as a Petty Officer Third Class Dog Handler. Following his tour in Bahrain, he chose his next set of orders on board Naval Air Station Kingsville, Kingsville, Texas. Shortly after reporting on board, he was requested to screen for orders at Naval Special Warfare Development Group. He successfully screened for orders and was transferred in March of 2007. At the Naval Special Warfare Development Group, he started out of Joint Task Force Little Creek, Virginia, in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He suffered a catastrophic injury, but got back into the fight. After leaving the service, he started Patriot Dog Training and a couple other businesses that we'll talk about, starting in his garage and growing to over 10,000 square foot of facility in the studio tonight, Benito Olson. Welcome, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if you want me to call you Benito, Benny. I've heard a bunch of different people call you stuff, so it's it's kind of up to you. You tell me. Yeah, so Eddie, probably one of the guys you had on, probably referred to me as Benny if he's right. the outside of the, the podcast, but you can call me Benny. Uh, my real name's Benito, but the guys would call me Benny. Okay, so, good. Yep. So we'll go with Benny. So, I, you know, in listening to all of yours, because you're one of the guys that doesn't have a book out there, um, but you have uh, a lot of different stuff. And, and I've seen some interviews, um, and I didn't just miss. You don't have a book, right? I don't, no. I'm typing something. But okay, no, good, no, good. I don't have anything. I thought we had talked about that, but I wanted to make sure. So, you know, in watching the stuff that you've been on, you've been very selective about who you go on, who you talk about the stuff. And a lot of it is because it seems to be very emotional for you. And some stuff that I've learned, um, I want to talk about your life before the military, because that was pretty interesting to me to, that kind of set you on your path. Now, uh, I want to talk about your mom and your dad. I want to first start with your mom, and then I want to talk about your dad. And the reason I want to talk about your dad is I want to see how that affected you kind of in the future because yeah. you saw something that happened. You decided to make a change. You didn't really go through with that portion of it. I mean, you did to a certain extent, but you went right. another direction in the same kind of fashion. So let's start with your mom. Just tell me about her and growing up with her. Yeah. So uh, first, I just want to say between my mom and my dad, I love them very much very much uh anything i say is it's not it come from a, a bad place at all it's just it is what it is and it's how i was raised love them both very much even even my dad for what you're about to hear um my mom uh started off as a single mother um just like a lot of the stories you hear out there uh she worked um well actually she was donating blood to like feed us i mean she literally was donating blood to feed us and uh you know growing up uh, she worked at um, a candy factory, um, and then she worked at a packing house. So a uh, meat packing house up in Salt St. Paul, Minnesota, which used to be the biggest up until they decided to ship everybody out. Um, you know, she just she worked really hard and really struggled. I had a step I had a stepfather. I won't go into that because it's really not, um, he's not somebody that I'm super proud of and I want to talk about um, just with the stuff that I grew up with, but, uh, uh, he came in later on in our lives and, uh, my mom struggled and worked really, really hard to, to feed my sister and I, I mean, we, I remember, you know, when, you know, again, um, just taking us, you know, to her work in this 
old, old car and, um, you know, dropping us off at our grandma's house at like, you know, before it, it, before the sun came up. And then I wouldn't see her until after the sun went down. So it's like, I didn't see, you know, there were times where we just didn't, didn't see her. And then we were just going to bed and then waking up and doing it all over again. You know, grateful for my grandma and grandpa that they were willing to take us, but it was a struggle. Uh, you know, with your father, uh, I want to talk about him for a minute. Um, with your mom, do you think that that gave you kind of your sense of work ethic? Cause you have a very strong worth ethic. And, and what I mean by that is not only do you have a strong worth ethic, but, but you told me whenever we first got in contact sure. with each other, you made abundantly clear to me that you were not a Navy SEAL. You said I wasn't, I was just Correct. with those guys. I don't want to take any any credit away. I don't want to do anything like that. And I, I thought it was interesting because even though you're not a Navy SEAL, you toured with DevGrew a lot on a lot of missions for a long time. Uh, you had a lot of friends in there. And I don't know that you give yourself enough credit on that. And that speaks even higher of your work ethic to me because you're willing to put in the time and not take as much as the credit. So does that come from your mom? So, yes. I mean, you know, when I think about being at dev group and I remember this one seal telling me like the most important advice he could give me was, you know, always be an asset. And so like I, now I remember growing up and having to kind of, you know, help take care of my sister and just be responsible and do the right thing. All those things that normally a parent would would be there to kind of walk you through. Like I had to do that stuff and I had to make those right choices. And so in a way, like I I was doing it my whole life, you know, to, to always be of something of value. And so for my mom, I think, excuse me, I think that it was incredibly important that, you know, I mean, that I was, that I acted the way I did and I did the things I did to just be responsible. And so she didn't have to worry about, us, even when we went into our teenage years, teenage years, especially when my dad wasn't there. I mean, a father figure growing up and missing him early on, but then missing that in those teenage years, I mean, I could have strayed off and did a lot of things. And luckily I didn't, I didn't stray off too far. I, you know, I got in trouble like every kid does. Right. Um, but you know, I, I think I had to grow up pretty fast. So. Do you ever think in that growing up where you say I had to take on that role without being really kind of told how to do it um, as a as a kid? Because we know how kids think you have kids now. I have kids and and you see it differently. I, I never understood it until I actually became a parent and then became a parent of teenagers. And my my wife and I were just talking about this the other day. Like you don't understand when people are telling you stuff when they tell you like, oh, good luck with that and stuff. And you're like, hey, it can't be that hard. And then you get to it. As a kid, doing all that stuff, were you ever like, I don't know if the word's disappointed, if it's uh, kind of angry at the situation that you had to do that, not being able to have that childhood, you, your father was gone, uh, you say that you don't even really talk about your stepfather, your mother's gone all the time at work, you're taking care of your sister, is there, is there ever a time where you're just like, man, you know? So back when I was doing, I really probably didn't think nothing of it because that's what life is. Right. Um, I wasn't, you know, thinking, oh, poor me. I don't have this. I don't have that. Um, Because we certainly didn't have a a lot. You know, my mom provided what she could. Uh, Looking back at it now, it doesn't, none of it makes me angry because if none of that happened, I probably wouldn't be who I am right now. Like it just, I mean, I, I believe you are a product of your environment and who, and, and, you know, it's what you what you do with it. Right. Um, right. yeah, I, I'm, I'm not angry at all. I mean, even thinking back, I remember, um, you know, I know she's not going to care, but I remember when my mom, uh, she, she had a, got a DUI. Okay. Um, she drove us, I mean, it stopped us into this re- retainment pond. They had these sticks sticking out. And, um, I remember when we had to go, uh, the cop came and picked us up and he took us to this like little foster home for the day. And my grandma had to come and get us. And, um, or I can't remember exactly who, but I'm pretty sure it was my grandma or my grandpa. I look back at that and I'm not even mad about that. I mean, I, you know, I looked after my sister while we were there for just the few hours that we were there. Um, everybody makes mistakes and I, I, I can't look back on it and be angry about it. I got to look forward. Like 
my mom's a wonderful person and she was doing the absolute best that she could for us. Yeah. And, and it's crazy to hear that because I don't think you hear a lot of people say that kind of stuff anymore. A lot of people want to rely on the bad stuff that's happened to him. Not, not necessarily look at the good stuff, not look at the good turns in life, but just, this is what's holding me back. There's always something holding me back. It's this person's fault or this person's fault or no one, I won't say nobody, but a lot of people these days, that's a problem in society now is everyone wants to blame everyone for their problems and never just go, look, it's bad, it's shitty, but yeah, I just got to get over it. Own your own shit. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think that's a problem. So I, I think that, that that pays forward to you because I've even heard you talk about whenever you got uh, into dog school and you make sure that you say over and over again, I, I didn't fuck anyone over. I didn't try and do that. I just wanted to go to the dog school. And and that was interesting to me in your interviews. When you talk, you always want to make sure that you let people know you're doing the right thing or at least trying to do the right yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, you look at my, you look at like, so I have a car dealership right now and on my, I'll show you after we leave here, but you look on the ads, It I tell you who I am in the ad. Like, look, I was a prior dog handler. I'm prior military. I just want to do right by people. Heck, I had a, a single mother come in the other day and, you know, people get into business to make money, but it's great making money, but it's even better doing the right thing for some. I mean, I get more off of doing the right thing by people than I do in any type of monetary value, you know, value. Obviously got to make money to keep going, but I love helping people and I love doing it the right way. So I've always been that way. And I, I wouldn't do it any other way. Well, I think that goes back again, tying back to your mom. I mean, a single mother coming in and, and doing the right thing is better than than making money. I think that's always going to be a, a, a soft point in your armor for you is taking care of someone or maybe a kid that can't afford a car or whatever. I mean, that's something, once again, like I said, you you understand that that's not normal. Like right. people don't say that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, they they want to make sure they're doing the right thing. They're getting what they need to get out of life and, and just kind of passing over. We see it all the time. When you were a kid, going back to that, you had said that you fought as a kid. You, you, you know, you had some fights as a kid and stuff like that. Did you look at yourself back then as a team player or were you kind of a loner back then and just hadn't built that team mentality yet? You know, I had I had I had friends growing up. Um, they were mainly on the on the basketball team, but I I didn't have like a group of people that I directly al aligned with. You know, growing up, you know, you had all the cliques in school. Um, you know, you had the the jocks, and then you had you know they call them thugs or whatever. You know, like um, skaters and whatnot. But I I I tr tried to get along with everybody, and you know, if they didn't want me part of their thing, then I, I don't care. I'd I kind of like being a lone wolf. I like, I like, yeah, I like just being me. And if people want to talk to me, then cool. If not, no big deal. That's kind of how I approached it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it still hurt as a kid. Like, you know, we, people talk about racism right now and you know, I'm, I, I come off as a white male, but I'm half Mexican. I mean, I was called spick and everything else. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on here, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was called all the names that you can think of. And so, um, you know, and then you go on the flip side, like I go play basketball down on the West side, um, just to go play basketball. And now I'm, now I'm too white, you know? And it's just like, what, you know, as a kid, you're just, so for me, I, after that happened, I never worried. I don't worry about so much about being accepted. Like if someone doesn't want to be friends with you and that's what I tell my kids, like, look, like my daughter plays hockey. And she's got this boy on, on another team that, you know, just doesn't like her because for whatever reason. And I said, you just show him Jesus, show him kindness, and you don't have, nothing else matters. As long as you're doing your part, and I'm not saying be a doormat for somebody. Of course. Obviously, but don't, if he doesn't accept you, he doesn't accept you. Like, just leave it. And, of course, hockey's a, it's a tough sport, especially for a girl down in San Antonio. I mean, it's, you know, 12 years old. Yeah. Well, and, and I have one that's 12 that's getting ready to turn 13. And when you talk about that, it almost makes me think as a dad, you know, it, it almost goes back to that, the girl that you pull the pigtails, that's the girl that you, you like or that you really sure. want. You just have no way of doing it. And and I think about my own daughter that 
she was in school last year and a, a kid just, you know, kept at her and kept at her. And, and he, he told her, I bet you won't hit me in the face. And yeah. so she hit him in the face <laughs> and uh, she got in trouble for it. Uh, he got in a little bit of trouble this year. They're the best of friends. They go everywhere together. They hang out with each other. And it's it's almost that initial uh, just breaking down that wall of understanding each other. And it goes back to what we talked about. A lot of people don't understand each other these days or don't want to take the time to understand to each listen. other. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, they say everyone's probably going through something. You never know what someone's going through. Um, and, and for you to tell her that it almost makes me think like, I think that kid may just not know how to, uh, you know, and he might have parents that say, don't, you don't have to be nice to everybody. You, you do this. And, you know, yeah. and that gets into a whole thing about, mm -hmm. uh, sports and what kids are being taught these days. But for you to teach her that, I think it teaches her to be strong too, and know when being, when it's being strong and when it's you know, being aggressive, I guess, right. is what you would say. Um, growing up further, you decide kind of you're at a point where you're like, man, OK, I, I got to get out of here. I got to I got to do something. Yeah. And you join the National Guard. I did. Now, you get your mom to sign for you for the National Guard. First off, do you remember what MOS you signed up for? It was that infantry. Like that? It was a, is that 11 Bravo? 11 Bravo, 11 Bravo yeah. Bravo infantry, yeah. So you sign up and then... I, I wasn't real sure, but something happens um, and you decide not to go or you, you don't go to right. the National Guard. I was a senior at the time. I think I was a senior. It was right after 9-11. So, yeah, I was a senior because 9-11 happened and then I graduated in 2002. Um, so, you know, I went to the first couple weekend things. There's like four of them. And I, I really enjoyed it. But the more I got to thinking about it, the more I was like, I really don't want to be here in Minnesota right now. Like all my friends are going to be going off to college and people don't talk about college. I mean, my family weren't, we didn't come from, a, I didn't come from a family that went to college got out and they, they worked, you know, in the factories or, or whatever. My dad, my grandfather worked at 3M for the longest time. So I asked if I could go over to the, regular army. So just, um, that's what I called it at the time, regular army, active yeah. duty. And I went and talked to the recruiter while well, the recruiter ended up getting his, his ass chewed for talking to me because he's pulling from the national guard. And then, uh, I just told the national guard, like, look, I didn't know the repercussions of it, of not going back. <laughs> so I found out when I actually joined the Navy that they gave me an RE three discharge, right. which required me to like required my recruiter to jump through all kinds of hoops just to get me into the Navy let alone get me into a job that I really wanted. Like the Navy was willing to accept me, but they were going to stick me as a deck seaman on right. some boat. Yep. So I just, uh, I didn't go back. And, uh, you know, it's funny, not funny. It's kind of shitty that somebody would tell somebody this, but the staff sergeant there basically said, um, you'll never amount to anything. If you quit, you'll never amount to anything. And to tell somebody that's a, a kid that, I mean, at a very young age that, all right, your life's over. You're going to suck at everything, like, just wrong. Um, so I ended up not going back, and, you know, people can say what they want. You can say you're a quitter or whatever. Um, I really wasn't. I just was I was really wanting to get out of Minnesota. I wanted to do something something else, something more. Um, and if I would have known that the National – I didn't know at the time the National Guard went over to Iraq, like, 17 years old, you know, and I probably would have stayed. But at the end of the day, it wouldn't have got me out of Minnesota. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and you know, it, it's funny when you say that though, that you, you don't want people to think that you're a bad guy for leaving or anything, but you weren't leaving just to not go back. You wanted to go active duty. Like you wanted to do it full time. It be your life. It be what you do. So it's not like you were like, eh, I'm kind of tired of formations. I'm tired of marching around. I'm going to get out of here. You actually wanted to take it a step further. Did they ever say why? Like, was it because of after 9-11 that there was, because that's right when I was getting out, was um, at, right after 9-11 happened right. was when I got out. Um, and then were, were they saying, like, there's just not enough people in the National Guard? Was they there... didn't tell me anything. They just accepted it, man. They, they, uh, they just said, oh, this guy's not coming back, and they gave me a discharge that I never received. I never got any paperwork or anything. I only found out about it when they tried to put me back in. I mean, you know, and for me, 
I've been working since I was 13, pushing carts at a local for, you know, four ninety an hour or five ten or whatever it was, minimum wage back then. My senior year, I was working at a hotel working overnights. So I would work overnight audit Thursday night and Friday night. So Friday, I would have to go to school after just working overnight audit. I was, I was tired. Like I just wanted to, I wanted to get out of Minnesota and, you know, um, I was ready to do something else. I wasn't ready just to stay there and to keep doing what I had been doing. Did you think that would the that was the only way to quote unquote break the cycle was to get out of there? Um, well, my mom had left, so my mom was leaving. She was going to leave at the end of my senior year. They were moving to Alabama with my stepfather, mm-hmm. um, and you know, it, I I just if if she wasn't there, then. You know, and all my friends are going to these schools, right. um, you know, and oh, by the way, I just broke up with, you know, a girlfriend I had, you oh, know, that's you always, know what I mean? High school, yeah, high school girlfriend, that's you like, it. just had, had broken up with that. And, you know, you're just like, I want, I want the fuck out. Like, I want to go do something else, like, you know, anything. And I would have went into the Marines, the Air Force, I, whoever was there that day, but the Navy was ultimately there that day when I went to the recruiting station. You know, I ask a lot of people this. Do you ever think that things happen for a reason? I, I absolutely do. Yeah. Like, the, you, that the Navy guy, of all the guys, was there that day. And, oh, not only was the Navy guy there, but this Navy guy was willing to take a risk on you, put his neck on the line or his balls on the line for yeah. you and say, all right, this guy's going to do what he said he's going to do. He understood what was going on. Do you know what you said to that guy or do you remember what you said to him? Like, look, <laughs> I know it looks bad, but here's, do you remember what you said? Yeah, it's a funny, funny story. Uh, his name was Chief Karst and I, I keep trying to find him and I can't find him. I just, I want to see if he's still alive. Like I, I've always wanted to thank him. Um, so Chief Karst used to come to our high school when they allowed kids, you know, recruiters to come to the high school right. and we'd see him at lunchtime <laughs> and he would ask, he'd ask me, you ready to join the Navy yet? And I said, no, I said, I'm, I don't want to join the Navy. Like the, all I thought of the Navy was boats, you know? So I went and joined the national guard and I was so adamant about not joining the Navy. And when I walked into his office, he was just shocked that I was even there. <laughs> um, Cause you got to remember, like I left the national guard. I had such a bad taste in my mouth for trying to just go over to the army that I enrolled in um, community college and so I was like my first semester in the community college when I went and talked back to, to Chief Karst and he was just shocked that I was even even there to chat with him. Like it was he was shocked. I mean it was I don't know how to put it like his face. I mean he just he was a good dude though. So after you do all this, um you you, you get in you decide that you're going to go. Is it everything you expect when you get there? It was shocking. Okay. You know, because uh, boot camp at that time, I mean, it was 2002. They could still yell at you. They could still cuss you out. I mean, yeah. they could still do all of those things. I don't know what they can do now. I'm pretty sure they can't do a lot of that stuff. But so for me, coming from a single mother who I really never had anybody that like really cussed at me. I mean, my mom took, you know, my mom got down on me a couple times, but I never had anybody like whoop my ass. Um, again, for except my mom, maybe she did one or two times. But, right. You know, that's a woman. And I'm trying I'm to. Fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Um, but uh, having like these dudes yell, like I started, I didn't even know what hyperventilation was until I went to, <laughs> until I went to boot camp. Um, you know, I'm sitting there like hyperventilating. I'm, freaking i'm actually crying like because i don't know what the hell's going on like with my own body right now i got these dudes yelling at me and they're like why are you you know why are you crying because i'm yelling because we're yelling at you and i'm like no i can't catch my breath right now and um so here my whole life i was dealing with different stressors and then now i went to boot camp and that was like an extreme stressor and you know i got over it and i got through it but it also helped me to get through other situations in my life like it just it just felt like the perfect building blocks as I went through life to just be able to handle more and more situations because then the next day I got cussed out at boot camp and it wasn't a big deal. Like I was fine. I wasn't hyperventilating. I mean, it just, again, it was a shock. They, you get, get on a plane they put you on a bus. They tell you to shut up and look straight forward. And, uh, you get to the, 
you know, you get to uh, Great Lakes and they stick you on a phone and tell your family you're okay. And then they strip you of all your clothes and it's not like you're not you anymore. You're, you know what I mean? Well, and that's what I was going to ask you. Did that almost feel like, uh, like almost like a rebirth, like a new you, like that's a whole new life right there. Like all that old is taken away from you, no matter what you went through growing up, no matter what your mom did, stepdad, anything like that. Is that like a whole, does that give you a whole new outlook on life? Like, this is it. I'm starting all over. I'm starting fresh. Yeah. So like, I didn't know that like you can actually, like there were guys in our, my art, my division that actually like left, like they processed them out. I didn't know that was an option. Um, and I'm happy I didn't know because it was like, it was a fresh start and I was like, okay, there's no turning back now. Like I'm in this for the next four years. Cause that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to be a police officer, Minnesota, passed a law if you served in the military um as a police officer you come out you don't have to go to college um you can go do your skills or whatever oh yeah and then then be a police officer because that's all i ever wanted to do up until i mean again my dad went to prison for doing certain things and i wanted to do the opposite and i I, again i tell him to this day like dad it sucks that you went to prison but i'm happy that you did what you did because it it pushed me a whole different way in your childhood, going back to that real quick, how long is your dad in prison? I believe he was in for five years. So he was in, he got out right at, he went in right before, I think I went into seventh grade. And then he got, he got out like, I think right as I was a senior. Now, up until the seventh grade, was he in your life at all? So yeah, the typical, you know, hey, you get to go see your dad every, you know, every other weekend. Right. Sometimes he went show, I got, I literally, like, you know, when they talk about kids sit, standing on the doorstep waiting for their dad, I was there. And you don't know who to believe because, you know, even to this day, like, I'll ask my mom, like, hey, did you ever keep me from seeing my dad? Because back then it was, your dad didn't show up. And so part of me, I, I don't know what, I don't know what it is, but I remember sitting on the, sitting on the fucking doorstep. Um, you know, we had a little, a little picket fence around our house waiting for my dad and I would wait there like, you know, one, two hours after he was supposed to show up and, and he would never be there. And then, you know, finally when he did take us over to his house, you know, I'd pull down a plate and it would have a pile of marijuana on it. And you're just like, you know, I knew what it was at the time, but I didn't really think much of it. But I mean, that's ultimately, you know, what he went to prison for was, um, dealing and, and, uh, money laundering. So, um, isn't that crazy to you though when you think back now that as a kid you knew what that was when you pulled it down? Yeah, I mean, uh at six at sixth grade, like I mean, there were kids in the neighborhood. Absolutely. That, you know, so I knew what it was. I just I didn't know that he was in it as deep as he was in it. I thought he was just I thought honestly, I didn't know he was a dealer, to be honest with you. I didn't know he was doing any of that. Um it yeah, I I didn't know. If you don't mind talking about it for a minute, a typical weekend with him. Um, you know, uh, a lot of it, you know, cause he was remarried. A lot of it would be going over to his, his house and then being with his, um, uh, with, um, how is it called? Uh, my stepsister. Okay. Is that what it'd be? Yeah. I'd be there with my stepsister and, you know, they had a big yard out back. We'd just go and play. And I, sometimes I go over to my cousin's house. I had, uh, uh, I was really close to my cousins, uh, Donnie, Antonio and, 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 uh, Angie, Angie, I'm thinking of her name, and I just, I, she's literally like the only cousin I've seen, you know, in the past few years. I, when I went back this last time, I went and had lunch with her. But those four, and, and their and their sister Marissa, so we'd go over there and we'd play football and play in their basement and stuff like that. I mean, it was really just spending time with the family that I that I didn't see. Were you were you close with him though, like? My dad. Yeah, when you spent the weekends, was it was it father and son time, or was no, it just you're at a new house I for the did, weekend? I didn't feel real close to him. I feel real close. To, I feel closer to him now. So, what was the thing that changed? Well, I think he realized that he, he had messed up, and he's he's done a, a lot to try to be more into our lives. You know, I mean, he's up in Minnesota. I'm down here, so calling and whatnot. I mean, it sucks. He's really not 
much into my kids' lives. They know who he is. But even my mom, my mom's probably closer to my sister's kids than she is mine only because when my mom moved to Alabama, my sister went with them. My sister stayed down there, and then she had her kids, and they grew up around her. So, you know, we're just so far away that, it, you know, that I guess that's the only thing that, that's kind of kind of sucks, you know. It, yeah. You wish it was more, you know. But my kids, um, they know that my my wife, now their mom, their other grandma, they're super close with. And I don't know if that's just normal or if it's just part of being at a distance away from somebody. While you're in the military, uh, family, are they... Do they take any kind of part in it? Like, you know, are you talking to them? Are you telling them what you're doing? Anything like that? Or is it pretty much you're, you're on your own? My mom went to boot camp. My mom went to watch me graduate boot camp. And, um, and then after that, um, she didn't really know what I was doing, I don't think. I mean, she knew a little bit about what I was doing. But, I mean, I went over to Bahrain. So, and I went there for two and a half years. I went as far away from Minnesota as I could. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and really the only person I kept in contact at the time was my buddy Ben, who owns a dealership too. And uh, he's actually, I, you know, followed him for the longest time before just starting my own thing. And um, so he's like a brother to me. And he's kind of the only reason why I went back to Minnesota is to go see him and his family. Right. You know. So you go over to Bahrain um, and you're, you're over there now. A lot of people would say they liked it over there. Uh, a lot of partying and stuff like that. You didn't like it over there, though, right? No, it, that shit was boring. I mean, you weren't, you know, you, the Iraq's going on and you're right down there. And you know what? You're serving a purpose. I mean, don't get me wrong. I enjoyed my time. I got to do different things. But I really didn't feel like I was doing the purpose that that I signed up to do. I had a dog. I'm like... You know, can I go anywhere with this dog other than sit here and sweep these buses and these trucks? But um, it gave me the opportunity, and I was really grateful for it. But at the same time, I just there, I knew that there was more out there to do. Um, and if I wasn't going to do it in the Navy, then I was going to get out and do it somewhere else. So di- when did you get your dog? Um, you're over there first, right? And then you get to come back to the United States and go to school, and then you go back over there, right? Correct, yeah. So when I got over there, I was just a regular gate guard, and I had to, like, just really build up my time there, um, you know, get my personal qualification standards done, uh, you know, these little PQSs uh, that, t- you know, that you can show how, that you know how to do your job. Um, and then after that, after I finally got them to, you know, approve me, I got um, sent over to the kennel. And really getting sent over to the kennel was, hey, you can go on over on your off time after you're done working and go and volunteer to go clean up shit and, you know, do everything that they didn't want you, didn't want to do themselves. Right. Um, and then finally I, I, I volunteered enough over, to the, over there that they – they requested that I come over on a permanent basis so that way I could eventually go to dog handler school, which was in Lackland Air Force Base, right down in San Antonio, and then go back over to, you know, you had to volunteer an extra year. You know, they're paying for you to go to school. Which is an expensive school. Yeah, it is. And especially, you know, if you're, it's different if you're taking orders and you're coming through the Navy, going to school, and then going to your duty station there. It's like it's... You know, there's like a budget and all of that. And, you know, I was fine going back over there, though. Yeah. Well, when you go over there, you know, you talk about I, I went over there in my off duty time to do stuff that no one wanted to do. Did anybody at the time when you were over there, did they see you as that? Because we've talked about that already in this, that, you know, people want to use people, people, you don't let them use you as a doormat. But was there anyone that looked like, man, this guy wants to go and, and I'm just going to make him do everything I can? Or were there people that like really encouraged you on the opposite side of that coin? Nah, I mean, there were, all of them were really great. I mean, you had some that, you know, I was an E3. Right. <laughs> there ain't no E3s as dog handlers in the, in the Navy. As right. a dog handler, you used to have to be an E5 just to go to school with a certain amount of years. So here I am like, actually, let me just back that up. 
master at arms to be a military police officer in the Navy at the time before nine eleven. Right when nine eleven happened, and before you had to be an E five. And then now, you know, you want to go to dog school, you know, and so you had to have some time in. Well, here I was a seaman, um, E3, and I'm like, you know, hey, not only do I want to be a master at arms, but now I want to go to dog school. <laughs> and it's not like I'm, I'm asking it for it to be given to me. Like I'm willing to work for it. I'm willing to, to do whatever it takes. And I was just, I was young at the time, you know, and it was a pretty big group, big kennel. I mean, it was uh, like 15 people in there. And it grew to be about 20 dogs, 23 dogs. Um, but they were all really great people. I mean, I grew up, and it wasn't in a crazy diverse town. This is about as diverse as a group you, as you can get, you know, different backgrounds and everything. Absolutely. The and military in general the is The military that way. in general is. But then when you go to the kennel, it's like its own little group. And, um, you know, it's... You know, I got paired up with a, uh, his name is, he was, he was, uh, first class and, you know, he always called me prospect and, and this and that, but he was always really kind to me. You know, he's in a uh, motorcycle group now and every once in a while, you know, we'll get into like Facebook deals cause he's on a different thinking, you know, we just think differently, but I'm so grateful for that person because he took me out, you know, and showed me some things, you know, he told me which books to go read um, you, you just don't get that, you know, at a lot of places. No. And for him to, him to do that and all of them to do it, you know, I mean, there were so many good people in that kennel and I know probably at first they're probably like, yeah, you know, whatever. Of course. Like, but, you know, I, you know, put in the work and they, they've respected it and they, you know, accepted me. So that was cool. So when they accept you, there there's someone there though. I, if I remember right, you had someone there that kind of pushed for you to get into school, and then pushed for you to do some stuff later on in your career, right? Um, so uh, I think who you're referring to is is Billy, but Billy wasn't wasn't there yet. Um, it was a uh, um, Chief Tucson at the time. He's still a really good friend of mine, Mike Tucson. Mike Tucson. Yep. Okay. So Chief Tucson. Um, was in there, and um, I think even he at the time was like, oh, who's this guy? Um, but, you know, he pushed to get me in there and then also pushed to get me into dog school. Um, you know, I, I'm i happy with the order because there was an order. There was three of us that went to dog school that were, you know, the new little recruits, and there was myself. There was this girl named uh, Bates, and she, fucking awesome handler a really great handler and then there was another another guy who didn't really care for got over there because he knew a lot he was just really smart but fucking couldn't handle over shit and 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 i know i know it's military's not the only place where it happens like oh absolutely sometimes it just i'm sure in the in the police force i'm sure there are handlers out there that are just they are who they are you know I think I, I, I agree with you. I think that there's handlers that are handlers just to be a handler. Does that make any yeah. sense to you? I mean, yeah. just so they can say I'm a canine handler. Yep. And and I saw I saw it when I was in the military because after being a Ford Observer, I was military police. So I saw handlers there um, that, that, you know, not by no means was it the standard, but you saw – you know, uh, onesies and twosies around that treated their dogs like shit or, um, you know, it was, it was more of a status for them than anything yeah. else. Um, and I'll say this, like he treated his dogs very good, but again, like, you know, when you're working a dog, like being able to read a dog and read what they're doing, um, it's just a whole, it's not like opening up a book and just saying, they're all the words. You know, right. It's like, you've got to be able to read the different behaviors and, um, you know, again, nice guy just you know but he got to go first and i got to go second but i didn't i really didn't care because i just wanted to go to dog school well and when you get there you're you're still a three right you're not even a four yet no i don't even nope i was still seeming there so yeah um you know even at dog school yeah. you're down on the freaking low totem pole <laughs> absolutely and now you're with other branches you know we had marines and uh army in our class i don't think we had any air force yeah no uh we might have had a couple of Air Force kids, but um, 
you know, you're there with Marines and, and, uh, the ones I was there with, they were low, just like me. And so, I mean, it was good. Like the staff sergeant that was in charge of my group, he would always fuck, fuck with the Marines and say, Hey, go put that, go put the, the semen in a, in a headlock, you know, or something like that. But it was, I mean, I had, I had a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I went to, when I went to dive school, when I was in the army as a Ford observer, I went to dive school and I was there with, uh, Marines. There was one air force guy and then Navy guys, but I was the only army guy there. So I was quite literally a fish out of water there. So I don't think they ever called me by my real name. I think I was doggy or shithead the whole time. And I mean, it it just works like that, but Mm -hmm. it also puts a little spark in you to, to work and, and, and get with the group. So I understand what you mean by that. Now, do you regret, this is going to sound like a crazy question, but I want you to think about it for a minute. Sure. Do you regret going so early in your career or would you think you would regret more not going to dog school to dog school? Oh yeah. Without a doubt, because I mean, it was like the perfect timeline. By the time I got to go to dev group, I was already a dog handler for like two, two, two and a half years, two years or whatever. And I was still young enough that, you know, I didn't have a family yet. Right. You know, I wasn't married when I went to damn neck. Um, so yeah, I would have absolutely regretted not going. Okay. I did. Yeah. Good. You go back to, to your duty assignment in Bahrain. Uh, you get Kingsville, Texas for your next duty assignment. Yeah. That, uh, but you're deciding like, okay, I want to get out of the Navy. Yeah. So I went to Kingsville. Um, you know, I was told it would help my career and I, I believe it absolutely would. And the people there were good, but man, Let's just face it. It's Kingsville, Texas. Have you ever been down there? No. I never had heard about this yeah, place base, when you were I mean, saying we, it. They had us in these barracks that had mold. I mean, it was a shithole. And I don't even know if they put kids, you know, put, you know, people in the barracks anymore, if they read down them. But, I mean, there was mold everywhere, and it was just, I wanted out. I was like, I've got one year left. I'll get out if I can't go do anything else after this. And it's not like I, I didn't throw a fit or anything to go to damn neck. It just happened to be that I was like, I'm getting out. If I can't figure out something else to do other than be down, you know, stuck in this. I mean, it was look, I know barracks are supposed to be a certain way, but I mean, it, it was bad. I mean, so are you wanting the whole time? Are you wanting to get, I don't know if I would say into combat, but are you wanting to get in the fight or what is it that you're looking for? Yeah. I mean, you know, you see everybody else doing, you know, you see everybody in, in Iraq and, um, not when I say everybody, I mean, you just, you see it on TV right. and whatnot. I didn't know what handlers were in Iraq and it's really weird the way the Navy works. They send you on IAs, like they'll send you to Iraq on an IA, an assignment from like Washington state. And like, I'm sitting over here in Bahrain and I'm like, I'm what? right down the street. <laughs> can I, can I just, can you just put me on a C-130 and I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> Um, and I get it. They have to send, you know, they have to send you to go get some training before you go over there. And I, I get it. But, you know, and there, the, oh, when I was in Bahrain, they were sending me to Dubai. Okay. There wasn't nothing bad about Dubai. I mean, it was a good time, but I was like, you know, all the per diem in the world, you know, that I got there, the stuff that I did with Dev Group, you can take all of that per diem that I got in Dubai and I would go do the stuff I did with SEAL Team 6 all day long. Right. And not get paid any extra for it. Just the, just being out there with the guys and, and feeling like you're making a difference or you thought you were making a difference. Right. Well, so that, that would be my question then. So you do this, you're, you're, you're a dog handler like you want. You're not necessarily going where you want to go or doing what you want to do, but you're a dog handler. Um, and you're deciding that you're going to get out. Was it just because you didn't feel like you had a purpose, didn't have a mission uh, or did you feel like, because I can't, I can't believe that you thought you were spinning your wheels, especially being a dog handler. Like you wanted to be doing those kind of things, learning those kind of things that you could use on the outside. So I can't imagine it's that. Was it just no purpose, no mission? No. Yeah. I just didn't really feel like I had a, had a purpose. You know, I was back down in Kingsville and, you know, sweeping vehicles at a, vehicle gate which anything can happen here in the united states and i get that but i wanted to be doing something more like it just 
I even thought about going blue to gr- uh, blue to green, like going over the army and go blue to green. Yeah, and uh, yeah. there I there was a couple people that did that to go special forces. You could do that, and I, I, at the time when I was looking at it, you know, you could go over and be a helicopter pilot or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like no shit. Like when I was in Bahrain, I asked my I asked my chief, like, "Hey, do you think I'm good enough to?" to go seaman to admiral because i want to go go fly jets or something like not not regular planes but you know you had seaman admiral you had that program blue to green all that stuff and it was like i just wanted to keep do it you know what what else can i do right you know what not not just anything though but like something of impact and i'm not saying that the people that are i don't want to i don't want to play down like the job. I mean, it's an important job to be down in Kingsville, Texas, sweeping vehicles that are going through the gate with the dog. But it's just not something that I, you know, it just didn't, it wasn't fulfilling that purpose. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and, and when you mentioned green to, uh, or the, the blue to green, uh, we had Mike Rutledge on here and he was a Navy SEAL that actually transferred over to the army and became a one sixtieth pilot. Um, and it was just, like you said, like looking at, at something different, trying to figure out something different. And he was doing, you know, one of the most exciting jobs in the yeah, world. Yeah, 160, man. And, and, and to go from SEALs over to the 160th uh, and, and had a very long career. But I, I think that there's there's people, uh, a, a lot of people in life that just have that desire to always be wanting to do something more or maybe different. Yeah, and it drives my wife nuts. Yeah. To this day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we'll get into that a little later with what you've done since you got out of the military. So we're on our first dog in Bahrain before we go to Kingsville, right? And that that was Bryn. That was Bryn. Black, all black shepherd. Just a straight detection dog. Couldn't bite worse shit. Um, So he's just a straight detector dog. Uh, Pretty much taught me everything that I knew on how to be a handler. Um, He had great change of behavior when he would smell odor he would throw his head up and do kind of a little prance and um you know really showed me the different things to look for when working in a dog uh shortly after that about nine months i moved up to a a green dog named leo and it it is probably my favorite dog at the time uh until i got to damn neck and i mean really I, i don't like to pick favorites but he was a wonderful green dog to, to work. He was a Malinois, Belgian Malinois. Full a of lot energy. of energy. No, you have no idea. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm sure you have a lot of idea, but yeah. So I want to do this when we're talking about this. As we're going through your career, I want to do it by dog. Okay. I, I know that sounds weird, but I want to do it by dog. So, sure. so we're at Leo. We still have uh, Digo. You have Digo, yeah. Uh, Breston. Uh, so Breston was a, he wasn't my dog, but he was a temporary dog that I used to, to get, to get over. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rex. Oh, Rex. Yeah. <laughs> there's Rex. Tigo. Tigo was another one. Yeah. And Brando. And Brando. Brando was my last dog. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I kind of want to do it. So sure. as we're talking about it and you and I have already talked about some of the high points that we want to talk about your career. Um, but as we get to those dogs kind of tell people, okay, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm doing and stuff like that. So we're on Leo, uh, and you're deciding that you might want to get out of the Navy. You have someone approach you that says, Hey, I got something that you might like. Kind of. So Leo was my dog in Bahrain. Okay. And then I had two dogs there and then I went to Kingsville and, um, they put me on a dog named kit for a little bit, Okay, but it was like being back on, it was like being back on uh, Brent again because the dog was super easy. Just there was nothing wrong with that dog. Okay, he had cataracts, but he's a great dog. <laughs> and I was really bored. I mean, again, here's a dog that does what you does do. what he's supposed to do. I mean, and, and, and a lot of handlers would be completely happy with that. They'd be like, "Oh shit, I don't, I don't have to really even work hard. Like this dog's gonna do everything for me." Um, the dog's never gonna miss aids when we're doing training, so. You know, when you miss a, an odor in training, you got to make up a certain amount of odors to, to you know, there's a Navy requirement for that type of stuff. You know, now being out of the military and seeing, you know, how I've learned to train different dogs, I think it's an absolutely stupid idea um, to have to do that. But Navy requirements, you know, you miss an aid, you got to make you got to make a certain percentage. 
And um, so I had Kit, and that was that was when I got the call. So I was down in Kingsville, Texas, and I got a call from a really good friend of mine that I'd served with in Bahrain. And he said, "Hey, man, you know." And I know if some if somebody's already listened to one of my other podcasts, they're gonna hear it again. But you know, he said, "Hey, man, I, there's an opportunity. Um, it'll definitely be worth worth your while." Because I told him I was like, "I'm I'm getting out, dude." Like I applied to the Texas State right. Patrol. And Alabama. And Alabama, yep. Alabama actually called me back about a year after I had gotten to Damn Neck. And I was like, no, nah, man, guys. I'm good. And uh, so he said, but you got to come up here and you got to do a PT test. You know, you got to go through a psych screening. And, you know, looking back on it, you know, you go through the psych screening and you're like, you know, you meet some of the guys that you meet and you're like, how the fuck did you get in here? Mm-hmm. Great guy, great guy, but you know, you're like, how how the hell did you get in here? And, they manipulate uh, those tests. Y- you really do. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna go in there and tell them. You know what I mean? Like, it's. <laughs> I talk to ghosts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, even when even when I got blown up and when extortion happened, you know, you're talking to Sykes, and it's like, well, if I tell them this, are they gonna kick me out? You know, type of thing. Well, they always say. And and you can you can say this for law enforcement, first responders, military. They always say no, it's not uh, something that will get you kicked out or something that will get you sidelined. Yet no one believes that. I don't believe it. And but here's the interesting part to that is that no one believes it. Uh, yet no one does it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. No one even dips the toe in the water to see, like, you know, even someone that might be on their way out that once they still won't do it then just to see. I can tell you this. When I went to do my psych, egg, the interview for the VA, the VA guy, because I was planning on that. I was just going to go in there and say, hey, I'm, I'm all right. I'm doing fine. And uh, he's like, do not go in there and do that. He's like, tell them everything that's going on because he knew everything that was going on. You know, like I like at the end of my career, like I'd go sit in my truck before I'd go to work over at Little Creek and I'd ball my eyes out because I'm thinking of uh, extortion one seven, you know, like for me getting blown up and getting hurt like it didn't. It's whatever. But when I lost all those guys, when we lost all those guys and, you know, when they laid me on top of Louie when I got blown up and Louie was, you know, was killed. um, That impacts me more than. Like, fuck my legs, fuck my wrists. Like, I don't really care. Like, but everything else, like, that played a huge, huge part on me. And so when I was doing the exit interview, like, I told the lady, and this lady, like, looked at me, and she's white. She's like, is is that everything? And I was like, yeah, that's that's everything. And you could tell she was just shocked by all the stuff I had just told her. Yeah, but, you know, and, and but that goes back to that. That's a crazy thing to me. When you get someone like that and and it almost seems like they've never heard that before or that they don't expect to hear that. Maybe, or they just don't expect you to be put all together like you are. Like, how are you not heavily medicated right now? Because I, I, I mean. But don't you think that's, okay, bringing that up, don't you think that's a huge problem with a lot of military first responders, law enforcement, is. is they are very put together until the doors closed. Mm-hmm. And then when when that life is over or that that service is over, that's when all the breaks in the armor come. Yeah, I think there's also a stigma that comes with it all and you can't you can't you're like a fr- like when I was I so saw I made chief, chief petty officer um at Little Creek and uh they we were doing like an initiation deal and they had put um markers in the ground like on this run and each marker you had to flip up and there was a picture with a chief's bio it was all the chiefs that have passed and of course which one do i pick up i pick up adam brown who was killed a year before extortion and i knew adam like adam we talked about my dogs he was really good with jet jet lee who was a dog handler on extortion and i picked up his uh, thomas uh, rat yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we picked up, I picked up his and like, I broke down in the middle of this chief and here I got this, this, uh, chief that doesn't know what's going on. He's like, oh, this fucking dude's crying. Yeah. I'm fucking like, I didn't, ex- like, I'm, I'm just trying to get through this shit and 
you know, I'm not sure what's what we're doing. And I and they say, go pick, you know, pick up the first one and read read the, the story or the, the bio about the guy. And the first one I pick up is Adam Brown. Like, you know, I mean, I, there's a there's a definitely a stigma out there that you can't you're weak if you talk about it. You're weak if you can't talk. I mean, it's just. How do you think we get past that? I think it's educating your leaders. I mean, you know, after extortion happened, I mean, I think that really opened up the doors, especially at, at Damneck. Like, they brought in all kinds of um, psychs and whatnot to, to talk to people. And I think talking to leaders about it, because even my, you know, my security officer, he, I don't think he, I don't think he understood. Like, towards the end there, he was, like, trying to figure out where the hell I was at, because I would have... I had a lot of psych appointments, but I'd lie about it and say, I'm going to an ortho appointment. And I just don't, I just didn't, you know, you know, I, he's already asking where I'm at. And I'm worried that if I tell him that I'm going to psych appointments, that it's going to change his per- perception of me. They already disarmed me when I went to my next command. Basically, if you're on certain medications, you can't arm up. So I was already the chief in the security department that couldn't arm up. You know what I mean? Like right. medical, you can't arm up because. So what does that do to your psyche? Oh man, it just makes you feel like a kind of worthless piece of shit, you know. Like, and I'm not trying to be that that person, you know. Um, I mean, it it it's uh it, it definitely hurt, you know. And you and you know now I'm a chief and. You're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be a leader, and I have all this shit going on. So, like, if I needed to, if I was having a bad day, like, I was down in the kennel, I'd just shut my door and, you know, fucking cry in there if I needed to, you know. And, again, I don't want anybody, to, you know, they, I hate to use this word, but they don't want to, you know, um, you know, thinking you're weak or, or you're, you know, what I, there's a derogatory word for it, but I didn't want anybody to think I was weak. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it ends up, I, I think, well, I know it ends up hurting you more than, than helping you. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, the crazy part of that is that it ends up hurting you more, but then you can't be the leader that you need to be either. No, and then so you're you're fighting that. You're you're saying, you know, I need to be strong, and then you're not strong, and then you can't be the leader, and it's this constant circle. Yeah. And then, you know, it you know, I was on uh Vicodin. I got I got hooked on Vicodin from the time I got blown up to the probably about a year after I got out when I said I'm done, I'm not taking this shit no more. But just to get me through the fucking day, like wasn't even about the pain it was just so I didn't feel shitty about myself and you know and I've told people this before like I was addicted to Vicodin like I was popping that shit just so I can get you know from point A to point B in it I didn't like who I became you know and uh so I think that's another reason why I I ended up getting out the way I did is because I just I didn't like where I was going and I couldn't be who I wanted to be and um yeah it was it was real difficult well, let's talk about when you got blown up. Sure. Uh, we, of course, had Eddie on, and, and that's kind of how it was a weird way that you and I connected together. Yeah. We are friends with a mutual person, Matt, uh, yeah. that he was listening to Eddie's interview and said, hey, I know that guy he's talking about. Do you want me to give him a call? And I said, absolutely. Now, of course, we hear it from, from Eddie's standpoint, but I want to sure. hear it from yours because uh, Eddie was injured – uh, you know, kind of, um, I don't want to say psychologically on that one, but it definitely got to him that, and he talked about it on the show that it definitely got to him. You were injured, not only, uh, psychologically, but also physically. And and I want to talk about, so what dog are we on right now? Digo. Okay. So we're on Digo. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, I want to talk about, because I, I've, I've heard what happens to Digo afterwards and everything, but let's set up the mission sure. on the mission and then after the mission. Absolutely. So, uh, Diego and I, um, we became a really, really great team. 
and I would say a badass team only because he was the badass and I was just holding on the leash. Um, you know, he had some uh, issues and things like that as far as accidental bites and whatnot, which, what dog, I mean, if you, if you're out there doing that, you're going to have, have some issues. So, um, Diego and I built up a really great reputation. Um, there were two dogs out there. There was myself and Diego, and then there was a seal with his dog. But only this night, you know, they were going to take the best dog. And and Digo was the best dog out of the two, which was I was happy about. But at the same time, I was a little bit, you know, usually when Mikey, his name is Mikey, when Mikey is out there, I kind of, he, he just, he was always looking at what I was doing and he would critique me. So I really did not want to fuck this up. And uh, so they decided to take Digo because Digo would go in a building and, man, he would just search and search and search to the point where I'd have to call him out sometimes because he would just keep searching. So we rode in on these uh, strikers, these little tin cans on wheels. And, excuse me, um, we rode in. Uh, we got to the vehicle drop-off point where they had dropped us off. I don't know how many blocks away. I'm going to say it's a few blocks. Um, before the mission... I had, uh, you know, made sure I packed a bunch of uh, water bottles with um, meat in them, like just different food because there's dogs that like to come fuck with you. And so I was chucking those things out as we're going. And uh, Does that work? Yeah, it works because they, they go and they try to tear all, and there's a pack of them, and so they all start fighting with each other and doing whatever. And they never mess with your dog? Then. No, uh-uh. And if they did, I gave them a gentle nudge with my foot and said, you need to move on. And no, to all the animal abuse, I did not abuse any animals. But right. at the same time, like, this is a highly trained dog out and... And it doesn't know. need to be fighting with and wild animals. it doesn't animals. need to get... You know what I mean? Yeah. I know it has rabies shots, but it doesn't need to be bit by something that has disease. So, um, you know, we're patrolling in and I'm just like, man, you know, this is like any other night. It was just easy, easy walk in through the city. A little nervous because... You know, those guys over there, like, have you ever anything in your life where they just don't play fair? Like, people that don't play fair. These people don't play fair. They rig their buildings. They rig themselves. They don't fight. I mean, when we went to Afghanistan and we got in, in some fights in the mountains, like, that was pretty cool. Like, much respect to those guys because they fight. But these guys are just, you know, the guy uh, before we deployed one guy you know he was killed um by stepping on some crushed wire on the corner of a building like they put it on the on the corner like it was you know so things like that it's just anyway so you know i was a little nervous about that um but never did i ever think i would get blown up like shot or something like that like you always kind of think that's in the back of your head like something like that could happen um but getting blown up like never you know i wasn't on any route clearance or anything like that but uh so we are walking in, and I got my dog, and the guy in front of me is, like, smashing light bulbs with his, the end of his gun because they, 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 you know, lit up some of the shops there just to keep the, um, the light out. And we get to the thing, and uh, I'm just sitting there looking the opposite way. I'm not looking at the target building because the biggest threat is sometimes not coming from that doorway. It's coming from behind you. And so I just kind of kept looking back and they start to do a call out and they have the interpreter start saying, Hey, everybody is basically everybody is in there. Come on out. And, uh, as they were coming out, they had a couple weapons and they started engaging people at the doorway. So uh, there was like two or three people in the doorway that were dead right in the doorway. They first called for all the, um, the kids, but for some reason these people decided to come out and fight. Like, if you know we're there, I mean, I get it. You, Again, whatever. But um, so they start coming out with their guns, and, and we, they, my, you know, the team starts engaging them on the walls and everything. And the next thing they call, they called for more people to come out, and this time these people did not come out with any guns or anything. They were just kids. And um, they get out outside the gate, and the young lady that was there, I remember... I, I remember hearing the interpreter say um, that there's still there's still one guy in there. He, you know, he's a pretty bad guy. He showed up, you know, a couple nights ago and is not coming out. So they give him one more chance to come out. 
or excuse me, they send one girl back in to tear down all the curtains and everything. And then uh, he goes, she goes back in, tears everything out. She comes back out and they, then they get on, the interpreter gets on the deal and says, hey, we're, not only are we going to come in, but we're going to send a dog in. So usually at any time that we said, hey, we're going to send a dog in, they're like, okay, we'll come out. Because they don't like fucking, they don't like the dogs. Same way with law enforcement. Yeah. And um, dude didn't come out. And uh, so we decided to move up to the building. I already realized that Digo is a cheater. And Digo will go for the first freaking body he can find, even if it's dead. Door. He'll, go, he'll go there and shake it around. And so I was going to send him. Normally I would roll up to the building and stay right behind the EOD guy. Because that's just EOD guy. Um, you know, they went through, they go through, um, green team at the command or they did at the time. And it's just somebody I can trust. It's like, I don't know how best to explain it, but you know, I'd stay near him because I watch what he's doing and then just, I'm there this time though. I saw a big ass bay window and I realized that there were dead people in the doorway. And so I go over to the bay window and I kneel down on both knees, and the team leader says that, you know, hey, we're going to chuck a frag in there, wait for it to clear, and then send the dog. So they send the frag in, and you can see it all on video. I have a video of it. Now, the only reason why I haven't shared the video with anybody is because, you know, somebody does get killed that night, and it's just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how. It's just a hard thing to, you know, share. But, um Anyways, he sends the frag in the door, and then I remember looking up and thinking, okay, this thing went off, and then all of a sudden, I just feel a ton of pressure, like, I don't know how best to explain it, like, a, it felt like somebody turned on a big-ass fan, and it was, like, just as, like, standing behind a jet, you know, like, getting from the blast, and, um, and then I was under the building, but when I had come to, like, I had thought, I couldn't move. I couldn't I couldn't do anything. I, I and I started screaming for help. I thought actually I was buried alive for a second. And I didn't really know exactly where I was at until I actually kind of processed it a little bit. And I couldn't move. And so I started hearing these muffled voices. And it wasn't until they picked up these big bricks off my face that I could see and I was I remember at the time I, I was laying down and I was like this. And so I could actually move my head. And, um, and then I started asking where, where's Digo. And I, so I started saying Digo's name. And then the, the guy who picked up the bricks was like, Hey, he's, he's over by the wall. Are you all right? And I'm like, I can't move. And he's like, well, yeah, you can't move because you know, the building just came down and he's like, just stay there. And I'm like, I'm fucking going anywhere. So, you know, um, <laughs> So Digo, he comes back over to me, running to me, and Digo's trying to bite everybody, you know. And I haven't listened to Eddie's part yet um, of this, but so is it, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but Digo's is he hurt at all? So Digo is hurt. Digo had a crushed nasal cavity and a fractured pelvis. He's laying um, about twenty feet away from me. Okay. Digo was attached to me with um, uh. A metal clasp attached to him, a metal clasp attached to me with the tubular nylon. It's just a little three foot lead. Almost like a buddy lead. And that shit snapped. Okay. Like it it pulled it didn't break the um the buckle. It like it pulled the threading. Like I mean just has so much power that it just took him completely away from me and So Diga's over there trying to bite everybody that's trying to help him. He also has a brick in his mouth. They come back over to me and they're like, do you have a muzzle? Do you have anything to like keep this dog from trying to bite everybody? And so again, you know, I've, I've, I've done a couple podcasts. So if they're listening, they know exactly what I'm going to say. I reach down with my left hand to reach in my left side pocket. You have a cargo pocket down here. I keep a soft muzzle and I, I can't get into it. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? And I look up and my wrist is just like hanging because it's broken. My wrist is, I'm like, that is not right. And so then I reached over with my my right hand and I pulled it out. And at the time, both my femurs were shattered. I didn't know that yet. Cause you, Any pain at all so no, far? No, because the, uh, I don't know if it's the adrenaline or endorphin, whatever's kicking in is kicking in. 
Um, it wasn't until they tried to, like, lift me up that I realized the extent of my injuries. But, I mean, when I looked down at my legs after they started uncovering me, I was like, that shit is not right. You know, and I can't, I, I can't move my legs. You know, I was like, that's why I said I can't move my legs. So I, I immediately thought, like, something was wrong with my spine or, you know, this big-ass building just came down. I got pictures of it. Like, it's, it's a big-ass building. And um, so, anyways, I give them the muzzle, and then they come back over to me, and two dudes try to pick me up. And I, I, I didn't think I screamed as loud as I did, but um, a couple years later or whatever, um, Guy told me that I screamed pretty loud, and I was, and he's like, "I think it's okay." And he's like, "It's it, it wasn't a bad thing." He's, yeah, like he broke both your femurs. So they tried picking me up, and I immediately it was I screaming, and I asked him to put me back down. Um, they were working with everybody else, and I'm just laying there like sucking on these fentanyl lollipops, and I'm biting them like because I'm fucking in pain, man. This shit hurts, and. They get everybody out. They, they're they working on getting Louie out. So I'm watching all these guys try to get Louie out. Louie is underneath a carport. Um, I'm, did Eddie talk to you about that? Mm-hmm. But go ahead. And it's like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I think it was like a foot thick. I mean, that's what it looked like in the pictures. And it just collapsed on him, you know, and I killed him instantly. And to get him out, they had to use these airbags that they used to flip over the vehicles. And, uh, so man, I'm sitting there watching all that and I'm just like, what, what is going on right now? Cause here we are, we're kicking everybody's ass, you know, I mean, for the most part, we're kicking everybody's ass every night we go out and here if somebody just kicked our ass and took a lot of guys out. And, um, so anyways, they get everybody else out there out of litters to put everybody on stretchers. Um, they call them litters, but. So they they get four guys over. They're like, then this is gonna hurt really, really bad. But we have to we have to pull you out. We have no more litters. And so they pick me up. And I mean, it was to this day I can I can remember that feeling. And uh, they take me over to the striker, and uh, they lay me right on top of Louie. You know, and I just met Louie like six months ago. You know, so I I wasn't like. Um, I wasn't like Eddie or or Dom who were like really good friends with him. I mean, he was just a nice, just a nice, nice guy that wanted to help me out. You know what I mean? And uh, I remember like three nights, four nights before, five nights before, I can't remember. He was showing me what to look for, for um, like crushed wire and things like that when I'm searching with my dog. and. Because you know, of that building, right? The the crushed wire on the Yeah, that's what they the, did. The you know, it was like, yeah. like, uh, equated to like Christmas tree. You know, whenever the wires touch, you know, it sets it off. And I remember him showing me that, and um, he just wanted to help. And anyways, they laid me on top of him. And I didn't really know he was dead or not yet. And um, I looked over at the medic, and I was like, is he dead? And he's like, yeah, he's gone. And uh, it sucked. It sucked really bad, and... I remember just, I was cold coming out of the building when they were pulling me out. And then I was warm. It was like, it was, it, it sounds so fucking morbid right now, but I mean, he uh, kept me warm. Like, I mean, I immediately felt warmth when I, when they laid me on top of him. And I, and it's probably coming from the damn heater in the, in the deal, in the, in the vehicle. But, um, I had to ride back with him. Uh, to the helicopter uh, they had to take us to a Casvac or whatever um, take us over to get put on a helicopter where they had the team of surgeons on there and <sighs> yeah I mean it just riding with him you know and I'm like looking at this guy and just thinking like he just you know he, he just paid the ultimate sacrifice and somehow I'm still still alive like why am I st- like why isn't he here with like why isn't he still here and um so we get put on the helicopter they take us to Balad and we get to Balad on the helicopter they pull me off D goes on there like can raise in hell and um the doctor comes over to me 
um, on my stretcher, and, and they were they're telling him everything that happened, what's going on. He's like, we need to get you in a CT machine right now to see what your injuries are if you're internally bleeding. I shattered both my femurs. So how I did not sever any arteries, I don't. Again, somebody's looking out for me. So they, uh, they, he comes over to me. He's like, look, before we put you in there, we need to straighten your legs. And I'm like, what the hell? Are you, what do you mean straighten my legs? My legs are straight. Like they were laying straight out. He's like, no. So he had two people lay on top of me. And I'm like, what the hell are these people doing? Like what's, you know, and I was thinking he's just going to like pull me straight. He went and did one of these, just, you know, jerked him straight. And, um. Hurt? Oh, fucking hurt. Yeah. I mean, we I was settled with where they were at, and then now he had to move them again. So he's like, all right. And they put me in a CT machine. They get ready to put me in, and I have a priest come pray over me. And uh, I think that's why, like, even to this day, I have a huge problem being put in an MRI or a CT machine because I automatically think of that day, and I automatically think that um, of when he pray, is praying over me and they give me the gas to put me out. You know, I'm like, fuck, is this it? Like, am I going to, uh, you know, am I going to see my kid? You know, because my, my son was, my, my wife was eight and a half months pregnant at the time. You know, so I didn't know if I was going to get to see him. There's so many questions that come to my mind when you talk about this. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, is this when war becomes real for you? Because if you remember, we talked about all this time. You're like, just get me in the fight. Let me, let me do all this stuff. Is is this night the first night that it becomes super real for you? No, no, it became real the night Mike and Nate died. Okay. So Mike and Nate, uh, Nate Hardy, Mike Coke, um, they died uh, February fourth, which is like four nights, three nights before, and. Uh, I, I have a lot of regret to this day even about those guys because, you know, the night that they were killed, I was on a different target building. Right. And um, we were all in the same little little town, just on a different building. And they sent me to the building where it, it felt like they had the most, like the most shit was going to happen. Because once again of Digo, right? The, Digo, yeah. Were... And then they had like, you know, the... Uh, you know, they had their um, surveillance all day, and so they could see what was going on. And um, Mike and Nate were on a different building that day, and that that really became, like, I mean, that's when it was, like, no shit. Because even before then, we were just kicking everybody's ass. Like, it right. was a lot of fun, you know. And um, the night they died, I was on a different building, and, um, you know, uh, the dog handler and the dog on the other building... The dog had went in, did a 360, came right back out. Well, there were two or three guys in there just sitting in the corners waiting for our guys to, you know, they didn't even break the doorway before they could, before they were engaged. And, you know, so I hold a lot um, in about that because, you know, it can't be everywhere. I, I tell myself, like, I can't, it can't be everywhere with the dog. Um, but I feel like, you know, if I Digo was there that night, you know, Digo was, they would make Chuck Norris jokes about Digo, like the opposite of what people do about Chuck Norris right now. Like, right. Digo was Chuck Norris and right. they would make jokes about it. And, um, you know, I feel like even that night, like if he would have just went in there and found one of them, you know, Mike and Nate might still be here. Digo might not be here. Um, you know, and again, that's another conversation. Like, Unless there was gunfire coming out of a building, I was willing to send Digo into anything to, to just, you know, find and, 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 and bite um, or detect or whatever. I mean, I was willing to use him for everything in order to save, you know, the buddy next to me and his life, you know. I'm not trying to sacrifice. I would never set, like, you know, we would never just send a dog into, Absolutely. you know, somebody shooting out a door. Like, you don't send a dog into that you frag the shit out of it and then you send the dog in afterwards. Um, so that was when it became real to me. And then this was just like, a, Oh, and by the way, you know, so another question that I have from it, 
I heard you talk about that, that you saw something, uh, uh, a friend from childhood. Is, is that at this time? It wasn't a friend. Uh, well, I mean, not a, I didn't say she wasn't a friend. Um, so, yeah, man, when I was blacked out underneath the building, it felt like forever. This girl that I went to school with growing up, I never, I, I mean, I, in passing, I would see her and say, hi, this is in high school. Um, she had come into my whatever, whatever was going on, and all, it was just her figure and, and her face, and she didn't say anything, looked real peaceful, and um, I told my wife about this. I'm like, please don't get mad at me. I did not, I, I don't know why it happened, but um, <laughs> at the time, she's like, I don't care. She's like, you know, God sent this person to you for a reason. So as I'm underneath the building, she appears and um, she's just very, doesn't say anything. And so I start thinking about this afterwards while I'm in uh, Chicago Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. I need to find out where she's at so I can find out why. And this is right after the election, so they are having a parade parade for Obama and all that and um, I'm in Chicago and I'm trying to just get on a computer and I'm wheeling myself down there and so I google her name and I swear to God to this day I did not know she um, she was killed in 06 in a car accident and um, I'm not going to say her name but anyways I just and I, to this day it still it gives me fucking chills like it's I don't know what it is. I, I really don't. Um, it freaked me out at the time because it was like, why? Why did she? Why did she come? Like, why? Why to me? I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't like best friends with her. You know what I mean? Um, so in two thousand and was it uh, fifteen? Was it fourteen? I reached out to her mom. I said, I can't. I can't keep this anymore. I said. This is what happened. I told her about her daughter coming to visit me when I was underneath that building. And um, I said, I just can't hold this from me anymore, especially if you're, you know, wondering anything about your daughter. And she had eat, met, uh, wrote me back and said that, you know, for the longest time she was questioning God and, and all this stuff, heaven, you know, because her daughter was killed, you know, uh, four years after graduating high school. And... Um, she was just grateful that I reached out and I didn't reply back or anything. Cause I felt like I did what I should have done, but I had held that for six years. Why? I didn't want anybody to think, <laughs> think I was crazy. Just like I'm telling you now, like people are going to watch us and be like, that motherfucker's crazy, <laughs> you know? And, um, I, I just, man, I was so grateful for her coming to me the way she did because it, it just made me feel at peace. Like even when I was in the hospital, like this thinking like this, this person was probably watching over me. I mean, you know, Jesus, Jesus was watching over me, but you know, he sent her to, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to what I, d I don't, I was underneath. The, I, it, I cannot even, I don't even know the words to this day of just how to talk about it because she was just there. And then, and then I was awake and I was, freaking screaming you know so um i you know it, when you talk about that night though there's so many different steps of that night where someone was watching over you i mean if you would have been in that door or made entry done done that's it the story's over well if i would have been where you know the eod guy was i mean i would have been there right there with him because like i said i stuck to his hip right uh, done. Yeah. A and that doesn't happen. Digo could have been lost easily. I mean, yeah. he's a lot smaller than you. Uh, you see her under the rubble and that's what brings you back. Uh, as you get and you're laid on top of your comrade, uh, and he keeps you warm. Yeah. There's all these things through the night that, that keep you there. And it just gets in my brain. Like, do you ever think you're too hard on yourself? Like you kept, you kept from telling someone that their daughter 
might have been the one that brought you back or how you felt in there because it was easily explainable that it's the heat coming off the lights or whatever. Do you ever think at some point, like, maybe I'm being too hard on myself? Probably. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am probably uh, the most critical of myself. And, um, yeah, I am, I'm really, really hard on myself with everything. And, you know, I've been told that many of times by a lot of people, but I don't know. I, I mean, I do believe I was kept alive that night for a reason. And I, and now that you, you know, you kind of walk through those steps, I'm like, okay, well maybe, maybe I'm not, you know. I mean, that, that's not a crazy thing. Like I, I just think about, you know, all these different things that you think, well, this and this and this, and then you start piecing the entire night together and, and the, the steps that occurred. And then I wonder how many people, if you had said five years before you told that story, how many people does that help? Yeah. yeah I mean, it, yeah, no, I, under, I, I completely understand. I mean, I, I felt, I, I mean, I, I actually felt just, I felt terrible, like not telling her mom, like her, you know. Because it's an incredible story. 08 is two years after her daughter dies, and then she's got to wait another few years. And I know people from, you know, my old hometown are going to listen to this, and they're going to know exactly who the girl is I'm right. talking about. And, um, you know, I feel ter I felt terrible that I had held that from her because... I mean, I would want to know that. I have two kids. and Well, and like you said, though, you're here for a reason. Maybe that was the reason that you made it through that night. It's very quite possibly. That, that might be the only reason. You, you never know. But, I mean, maybe that's the reason was to bring peace to her. Yeah. Um, because it just seems, in, and we'll get into it about extortion and everything, but other than your wife and and from everything i hear that you talk about your wife she's like rock hard yes like yes. when they came to tell her <laughs> about you and she's like already heard talk to him on the phone yeah. i got to get back to laundry yeah. like at any point she could have broken down and things could have gone wrong and she she grabbed the reins and just took over for you yeah i i believe it i mean again i believe i was put there for a reason like every everything else and i believe that you know, she was married to me for a reason. I think, you know, I always hear these horror stories about guys that get hurt and then the the wife can't, you know, or the opposite, can't handle it. And, um, yeah, I mean, she was rock hard and she was, uh, you know, eight and a half months pregnant, you know, with my son. So she could have went into early labor, I guess. Yeah. You know? I mean, there, there was a ton of things, but... Going back to that, there there's so many points in your life where um, people could have, you know, I guess like covered down on you, and yeah. and you became more of their security blanket than they did for you at all these times, and, and especially with, you know, your friends uh, that happened four days before this yeah. uh, with extortion. You know, th there's I don't think a lot of people think there's not a lot of time to process. Like they talk about some people will see, or m the, the majority of people will see like, I don't know, like three or four critical incidents in their entire life. Right. You had two critical incidents in four days yeah. leading up to some. And I don't think that this goes back to how people are taken care of when they get back here, the mental health aspect and all that. I don't think people take that into consideration. They they just look like you said about that chief. Oh, this guy's fucking crying. What's the deal? Well, if you went through as many critical incidents, you might understand what's and going it's, on. It's not even like like this this interview or any other interview that I've done podcasts. When we're talking about it, I can prepare to I can I, I can prepare myself mentally to feel a certain way. And you know, I cried a little bit earlier. But I can prepare myself to not break down and do all that. But like that night or the day when I was out you know, going to chief's initiation and I picked up that thing. Like it was like a, it's a shit that just pops up out of nowhere that trips you up. Right. You know? Right. So, so all this happens, you go to Chicago, you make it through, you rehabilitate and you think 
I'm going to go back into the fray. Um, yeah, kind of. I, uh, so I went to Chicago. They, they gave me the best care that I could possibly get at the time. And, um, I heard those bills were pretty high, but I didn't, I, I saw a couple of them in the hundreds of thousands (laughs) and, um, but I didn't pay for them (laughs) luckily. Um, so I went back to Virginia beach and Digo was already back over. This is like, uh, nine months later, Digo was up back over in Afghanistan with his new handler. Digo had healed up completely. And, um, Digo was having some issues over there. And so they were wanting to bring the handler another dog, who was Breston. And that was like my opportunity. I was like, I'm not going to be no courier and just bring the dog. I was like, let me bring the dog and work the dog and then, you know, help help Digo out. I heard you say that, that I'm not a courier. <laughs> I'm I'll not. go, but I'm working. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I may have... I may have fudged or lied a little bit about how I was feeling and the strength of my legs, but the surgeon signed off and the medical people signed off. And um, I knew I was good enough not to put the team at a liability. Like I wasn't going to be a liability for the team. You know, I knew I was going to be able to go do great things if put in the position to do it. And so I went back over there and, um, I was riding on the bus uh, from the, uh, they're picking up people over in Afghanistan at the airport to bring us to the, uh, from the uh, flight line to the, uh, our little camp that we had inside the base. And uh, I remember getting into the team room. The, the team was already on a, a mission and I was watching them and, and they came in and they, like, the guys that were with me that knew who I was, like it was, they were just kind of shocked that I was there even. I mean, they were happy I was there. And uh, one of the guys was like, uh, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I brought Preston over. He's like, okay. I said, no, I'm, I'm here to work. He's like, you're coming to work? And I said, yeah, I want to work. And, uh, you know, it's the same, you know, uh, he's a, a recce guy, a sniper. And, you know, and I, I've said this before and I've, People are listening. Like he told me, he's like, you know, he told me this sometime later. Never would he have expected one of his own to come back, and if, you know, from what we did to, you know, having me who was just a fucking master at arms, you know, dog handler. I mean, it was he he, he had a, a lot of respect, I guess, and and I was just grateful just to be back with the dog. Uh, and, and you point out again that you didn't try and screw anyone over. You just wanted to go back over, do your job. Now I have to ask though, as strong as your wife was when all this happened, is she in a great mood that you're going back over? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I don't, I don't think so. No. I mean, I, I chose that place over my family multiple times. I mean, even after that deployment, I decided to stay there an extra year. Well, I was already going to be there for an, another year. Stay there for an extra two years. You know, I was there till 2012. So I technically I wasn't going to be over there when extortion happened, but I decided to stay another year, which led me to, to still be there when that happened. And um, again, I believe I was, I stayed because I was needed for that event. And um, no, she was not. I mean, you know, how would, how, yeah, I put myself in her shoes. How would I feel if, you know? So here's the question that I ask a lot of guys, and it's a lot of the, 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 uh, operators. A lot of them say, I chose this over my family. I chose this. I kept going back. I kept going back. And my question to them every time is because now when they look back on it, they don't regret it at all. No. Um, but they they think that there might be other ways uh, that they could have taken part in the family and stuff. So my question to them always is, why? You, you have a newborn at home. That's the first thing you thought of when you get blown up. Hey, I got a baby on the way. And, and you have all these good intentions. This is exactly how I asked them. You have all these good intentions in your mind. I'm, I'm a family man. I'm going to be a yeah. dad, a good husband. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. And then you go, but I'm going to go back over here. Yeah. And you take that risk again and again and yeah. again. 
Why? You know, for me, it was always the thought of, you know, myself or Digo not being, being there to, to help and, you know, they might laugh at it or whatever, but to protect. You're talking about that goes back to the night that you weren't with those guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. The thought that they're out there and, and I'm not out there with the dog and it's not even just, it's not even about me. It's just about the dog, the ability of the dogs that I had to do the job. You know, the fact that one of them could get killed because that's why I kept going back. I mean, that's, it wasn't because, I mean, I certainly enjoyed the job. I loved it. It So much fun, but um, it was mainly about being with the boys and, and just the, the dogs were an asset and, um, and I know somebody else could have done it, you know, but I don't know, man. I just, you, you just, I just, I just wanted to be with the boys and make sure that they're, they had the best asset they could. So when do you realize, cause you said it earlier. When do you realize I can't be everywhere? I, I, I can't not necessarily keep up this pace because I don't think it was that, but I, I can't be everywhere. Like at, at, a, at some point, I'm going to have to turn this off. I don't think I ever did that. I'm not lying. Okay. No, I mean, the thing it did, it, the fucking job did it for me. When extortion 17 happened, mentally, I was done. Like, I knew right then and there, I can no longer do this. Okay. So, let's talk about extortion. Once again, just like with the night that the building blew up, um, I want to talk about before, during, after. Sure. Um, and and if I think of things along the way, I might come in, but I want you to tell your story about this one. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I remember that night very, very well. I actually talked to Jet Li, um a couple hours before they went out. Uh, Jet Li was a dog handler. He's another mess, hurt arms. And uh, we were just bullshitting. And, um, yeah, we were just talking on the phone. He was down in um, Shank, Fob Shank. I can talk about it now because they gave all the fucking bases away. Um, He's down in Fob Shank, and I was up in J-Bad. And, uh, you know, he, uh, we were just, again, we were we were bullshitting. We were talking about our uh, how he likes to mess with our... Uh, He's a retired master chief. He was a retired master chief back at the head shed. He'd always get him going. And um, so, you know, again, we were just chatting. He's like, oh, he's like, something came up. I said, we got to, we're going to, we're spinning up on something. We're going to have to, I'll let you go. So I let him go. And um, I went back to my normal night because we weren't doing anything. It was some weather and whatnot. And uh, I was watching Family Guy. Out of all things, I mean, there's, when there's nothing to do, you either work out or you watch TV shows. Well, I was going to school, too, at the time. I was taking classes while I was over there online. And um, so I was watching Family Guy, and I was FaceTiming my wife or Skyping or whatever. And um, my buddy walks in, and I turn around. He's like, you need to you need to fucking come down. And, he, and uh, you could tell on his face that something was really wrong, like really bad. I told my wife, I was like, I got to go. And she even said at that moment, she's like, she knew something bad was about to happen. And um, he's like, turn it to, you know, we had the secret, you know, computers there. And, you know, he turned it to this feed. He turned it to that feed. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? He's like, it's a helicopter. I'm like, is it, is it ours? And he's like, yeah, it's ours. And... um I was like, well, who's who's on it, you know? And because normally, like when we went out, like they put us on two different helicopters when we go out. It's like I think everybody was on there from from two troop. Explain that two different helicopters. There's a reason yeah, for so that. We, so normally, when we would go out, there would be two helicopters, and for weight purposes, they would put us on a couple different helicopters. Not all the time, but most of the time. And he, uh, just for weight purposes of getting, getting to point A to point B. And I also think just in case something like this were to happen. And so, uh, he said, I think everybody was on there. And I'm like, what the fuck do you mean everybody? Like, 
you know? And he's like, he's like, uh, it's like jet too. And he's like, well, yeah. And so not that that would have made it any better, but, um, so we go and I go to the, um, like our courtyard that we had out in front of the gym and talking and everybody's like, yeah, the, the helicopter just went down. There's a secondary explosions and, you know, cause it's on fire and, you know, all their shit's going off now, but there's no, no, no movement, no nothing. And at the time the Rangers were, they were booking to get back there. Cause these guys, our guys were sent in there to go chase some dudes that were running up a hill that had weapons. You know what I mean? Like fucking two years before that, we would have just dropped some bombs on them and said, Hey, they got weapons and they're, they're moving on us. But we sent, we sent the, you know, our guys in there. I mean, and don't get me wrong, our guys, they wanted to do that shit. But two years prior to that, we would have just fucking sent a Pred missile or whatever. Like, you know, why why chase some dudes up up a hill? So what changed? I mean, I know I'm not going into politics. I swear to God. But, Absolutely. But winning the hearts and minds of people, like, there is no winning hearts and minds over there. I mean, either you're, you know. Taliban or you're not and even if you're not those people don't want you there anyways they're living a certain I mean they don't give a fuck they don't like you like that I mean they're they, they've been living the certain way they live for hundreds of years because that's the way they want it that, that's the way they want to live and uh, here you are coming into their you know space but the rules of engagement, and again, I'm not no fucking general or anything like that, but they definitely changed because, you know, before if somebody came out with a gun, you could shoot them. Now it's like, yeah, please, will you, will you put down your weapon, please? And it's like, well, you know, think about the law enforcement, like how fast they have to react, you know, with, with things. And I equate like law enforcement, what they have to do here is so much harder than what we had to do over there. I mean, it, but it's literally the same. It's, it's like they were, they're literally asking us to put down, ask people to put down their guns in order to, you know, engage them. Right. So, but yeah, the rules of engagement change, even with dog bites, like you used to be able to send a dog on anybody. And if the dog bit somebody, like no big deal. Now you had to justify why the dog bit somebody, what happened. And it just, it was really bad. And. So I think a lot of that was, you know, the rules of engagement changed and, um, that's okay. Like it, it, you know, it's, it's, I get it as politics, but it's just real shitty. Um, anyway, so our, our, yeah, we were sitting there waiting and, uh, they were going to send us out to go and, and, and try to help recover those guys and get those guys, but they decided against it. Um, because somebody would end up getting hurt, you know, cause if they send us out there, we're getting into that fucking helicopter one way or another. If it's even, I don't give a fuck if it's on fire, like, and somebody will get hurt doing it. And so I think that's when they, um, you know, decided to pull us back and say, no, you guys aren't going to go down there and help figure that situation out. We're going to send you to go pack up all of their stuff, which that was hard in itself. I had to go pack up all of, uh, John, John Duandara, Jet Li's stuff, and I helped a couple other guys pack up a couple other operators' stuff. And, uh, you know, I was just in Fob Shank a year before that, riding in the same helicopters, doing the same thing. And I definitely did not like it, you know. Um, Can we, I mean, do you mind talking about that for a minute? Yeah, I mean, it was just out, you know. Because I've never heard you say that about your entire career. I didn't yeah. like doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Okay, so, like, you know, when you're used to flying in TF-160, there's just it's just a different dynamic. And when it's not TF-160, like, I remember going over there, when we would land, and even though you're out in the middle of nowhere, using, like, overt light to land in the middle of the night somewhere, like, TF-160 never did that shit. You know, like. Those so, guys are incredible. I mean, they're just they're absolutely amazing, and I nothing against anybody else who's not them that is, that was over there doing missions. But you know, you spend a shit ton of money and time on these these seals and all these other enablers that are out there with them. Like, why? 
why stick them? I mean, it, even if even if TF-160 would have been flying that night and the RPG hits the helicopter blade or whatever, it's it's, go, it's not going to matter. No no difference. I don't think it'll it, it would change what happened. I I I agree with you that I don't think it changes, but I think there's a different dynamic. There there is. Definitely a different yeah. dynamic. When the actual person that did this, uh, when they got hunted down, now I've heard you talk about in interviews before that it was a smart munition that took them out. Um, yeah. And you had talked about it was a little too quick um, for them. Yeah. I think that's the word you said was too quick for them. Can we talk about that and what you think about that and what you maybe you think differently today? Yeah. So, I mean, at the, at the time when you know, everything was happening. The, the guy was actually bragging about it. I think they got him up on a phone bragging about it, of what he did. And he was on his way to Pakistan to go have a celebration or whatever. And um, they decided to, instead of sending us out to go get him, they just they dropped a, dropped a bomb on him, and we all watched it. You know, we watched it as it happened, and... You know, to me, I just feel like, you know, that was kind of a little too easy for the guy who just took out, you know, 31 people. I mean, 31 of your best. Right. You know, and a dog. You know, and and it's interesting when you when you talk about that, when you say it's too easy. I've always thought, too, on those kind of missions where there's not that person on the ground to confirm and it's this it's kind of the same way in law enforcement if if there's no one there to actually confirm does it happen like you see that it happens and yeah. it, it, there's always that kind of that aching question in the back of your head did did really what we thought happened happen i know that sounds very conspiratorial and things uh, like that just, but it's just like what just happened with you know over there in in afghanistan when they bombed the gate Mm-hmm. And they supposedly bombed. They they got the people and ended up being a bunch of kids. And there's nothing funny. About it. Like it, it, I'm not like making light of it. Like it it's absolutely shitty. Like that we would just it, again. I don't I don't believe that's what happened with the extortion deal with us just you know laying a bomb out on somebody. But when you see it happen, you know, in August. Well, and and that's what you're saying. When you're talking about the Marines that were killed, the 13 yeah. Marines that were killed, then we go back and we do a strike, and they're like, okay, we took care of the problem. And then two or three days later, they're like, well, maybe we didn't take care of the problem. And now we're going to pay them a few hundred bucks per, you know, they're, they're talking about payouts for the Yeah. And, it's, it, it's, it, and I think people think about payouts, and they think about the millions of dollars that have went out here in the United States for, you know, People killed by police. Like, let's just use that for an example. It's not millions of dollars over. It's hundreds of dollars, you know, for taking a life, you know, and it's, I, yeah, I don't, it's, it's not right. Well, I think the, the bigger thing that's not right of the whole thing is that, that when we don't come forward at the very beginning or we're not sure, yeah, and then then you have to question because what happens is all those kind of dominoes fall afterwards, uh, and then you're unsure every time. Was yeah. it the right target? Was it the wrong target? Was it the right people? Was it the wrong people? Whatever it was, um, th- that's the that's the thing that's crazy to me. I, I wanted to talk to you about a couple more things. Sure. Um, I had heard you say that w- when you saw uh, at when you went to the ramp, that you'd never seen so many coffins loaded up onto a plane never. before. And I'd ask you before, when did you kind of lose? Um, when were you? When did you know it was time to go? Uh, and we had we had talked about that. When did this the switch flip? I mean, yeah, it was. I mean, it was it was there at that. At, it was. I would say it started when I had to, you know, they were bringing some of the equipment off of the helicopter. Right. You know, and it still had the smell of charred remains. And, um, 
at the time you're just you're just doing it because you know you need to do it and then when they loaded everything up on the every when they wrote, loaded every everything up all their personal belongings and then when we went to the ramp ceremony and there's all those coffins and you're like fucking I'm done you know like I mean I still did I still stayed out there absolutely we, I finished you know I finished the deployment and I went out and s- still did a lot of good things to finish it off but um I knew that that was going to be the last one because I'm not going to put my wife my wife actually flew back from Chicago she was staying with her mom at the time to help with the massive situation that was unfolding in Virginia Beach with all of those families having to come and you know do all of all the stuff they did to you know get the boys back and then you know funerals and did they when that happens is anybody else talking that way do you hear anything like that or are you kind of keeping it to yourself it where to you myself. say everyone kind of keeps it to themselves i kept it to myself uh and of course the mood changes the it has to change but do you see in the mood change of course it's a somber one but does it turn anger sad vengeful um, what? guys wanted to go back out they wanted to go back out and fucking do something then just sit there on the base and you know have to think about all that shit like we but you know at the same time like you know you have leaders that are smarter than we are probably most of the time mm. that are like, no, we're not going to send them back out right away because they're just going to go out and, I mean, go out and take it out on somebody. You know what I mean? Yeah. but And that's where I have the problem because you'll hear that too in law enforcement. You'll hear the command talk about that too, where uh, we trust these guys until we don't trust them. Yeah. Does that make sense? I yeah. mean, th- when you say that they they think, oh, we can't send these guys back out because something might go wrong. Well, also this might be the way that they're getting through the situation, and they're gonna do the right thing. And and it's it's weird to hear they trust you until they don't trust you. Yeah. I mean, you know, we ended up drinking a lot. I mean, so it was like you know alcohol. Yeah. You know what I mean, like. When you can't go do anything, you're either going to work out or you're going to drink, you know. And I know you're not weren't allowed to have alcohol over there, and I don't understand why. I mean, but I mean, if you're old enough to sign up for to go to fucking war, like, to be able to, you know. But um, yeah. I mean, it it's uh, we ended up going back out though. I mean, we ended up being able to go back out and fish out. Do you have a talk with your wife at all? Are you are you talking to her about how you're feeling or how she's feeling or anything like that after this happens? Yeah, um, are you talking about like directly right after? Not, not directly right after, but like I mean, now. well, even not even now, but even as you're approaching the end, where you're saying it's time to get out, are you guys talking about yeah, it? Or are you? We talked a lot about it, and um, after I left that command. I, I told her one day, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I cannot stay in the Navy. I can't, I, I just, I, my body hurts too. Like before, my body hurt really bad. My legs hurt really bad, but I had a purpose. No longer, I no longer had that purpose. And so I just was thinking about the pain and, you know, and I was going to see a psych and, you know, I'm over at Little Creek and they still got, you know, they got the seals over there too. And I hear helicopters all day long, and it just, it made me miss doing what I did, and it brought up a lot of really bad memories, and I was just tired of, I mean, I was just tired of feeling the way I was, and we ended, I ended up getting out and coming all the way down to Texas. You know, I wanted out of Virginia Beach. And it's interesting to hear you say that, that you wanted out of uh, Virginia Beach because when we very first started this interview you wanted out of Minnesota I did yeah and it seems like at, at points in your life it, when you're ready to go you're ready to go and to step away not only I guess mentally but physically you step away yeah like by moving away from it now 
was there ever a point you you had said that you you know had taken pain pills and and were drinking did you ever hit a low point before i, I know we talked about that you had you know cried and yeah. closed the door to your office and stuff but did you ever reach a low point where it kind of scared you where you were like ooh no i mean it, it it really just came down to it was a friday night and i went to go pop a couple of those the vicodin pills they gave you and and I just was like, what am I doing? This was out when I was out of the military. And I was like, what am I doing? I, I still have my whole family. I have my whole life ahead of me. I have, I like literally cut it cold turkey. And I've heard where people can't even, like they got to go to rehab to go get off of that shit. And I just was like, because I was taking two of them. And they were like the, um, the 10 slash, I don't know, 325s or whatever. I mean, it was pretty good dosage, and but uh, you know, drinking and taking that, like, just like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? Um, when you're around your wife and doing that, any any problems? Did it create any problems? It didn't. I mean, I'm not not blind to know that she didn't know about it. I right. Mean, she knew about it. Um, you know, but she, you know, when you're only happy when you're on that shit, and you can see it and and you know it's affecting your family you know because it's not like you just come off of the pill and then you're you know during the day like when you're off of it you have those mood swings and it, it's not healthy um so you get off it now you have one kid have you had the second yet when when you're I getting this, out yeah i had the second in 2009 okay so after I did the deployment to return to Afghanistan, after I got blown up, my daughter was born in November. And then I went back over in April of 2010, Ten. I believe. Yeah. April or June. I can't remember exactly right off the top of my head right now. But it was during the springtime. Um, and so ever, ever look and, like, uh, ever think, like, I'm talking about, like, with your childhood, with your dad, do you ever worry about that kind of stuff? Like you, you weren't doing, I know you wanted to be a different dad. Yeah. Uh, especially as, as the child. Cause you, you talked about that, like sitting on the stoop waiting and stuff. Do you ever worry that you weren't doing that? I mean, is it affecting no. you while you're working? Um, while I'm working, no. Um, like now I look back on it and I'm like, man, I missed so much. And these assholes just gave the country back to the Taliban. And um, it was like, all for what? You know what I mean? Like, I know, I know that it was for something. I never will not think that. But it was just, you know, it, you know, we sacrificed so many guys. We, guys had sacrificed their families to, you know, go and do that stuff. And, um so, yes, I look back on it, and I'm like, you know, I could do more, but I'm also grateful because this has all made me who I am. Right. And um, luckily my kids were young. We go back to that thing, that comment or that question you asked me earlier, do you wish you would have waited a little bit longer? Hell no. I do not wish I would have waited because, I mean, my kids were still young enough to where they really don't remember anything, and now they're just starting to ask me questions because they're turning 11 and 12. Right. But... I mean, I'll tell you, like, and I'll never get it out of my head, you know, watching, you know, kids and and whatnot cry when their dad doesn't come home and they're older and they, and they know what's going on. Like, that's right. the worst feeling. I would never want my, you know, I'm, I'm grateful my kids were young enough to where, if God forbid something did happen, like, yeah, the dad's, dad's gone, but, you know... Hopefully it'll get easier for him. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. just, it was hard watching some of these, you know, some of these kids, you know, their dads aren't coming home. And you know. so you get out, you've done all this for your country. I hear that you couldn't even get a job. Like, like at Home Depot, you couldn't even get a job. I applied everywhere. I apply, you know, like Walmart, like I even applied for like some of Walmart's corporate stuff for like their security and whatnot. It was weird, really weird, like, and I, you know, and I, 
I know people are like bullshit. Like he could have gotten a job. It's not no, bullshit. No, no, no. No. Like it, it literally like right now, if, if I would have gotten out right now, yeah, I could find every fucking job in the world right now. But like back then when I was getting out, it was 2000 and 2012, 2013. And I was either overqualified or underqualified. And when I was underqualified, I was like, well, how about you just teach me the job and I'll do it because show me anything that you want me to do and I'll, I'll do it for except, you know, performance surgery and shit like that. Like, I get it. You got to go to school for that. But like, right. show me any job that doesn't require that and I'll do it and I'll do it a hundred times better than the next person. I promise. And um, unless they, unless they're a high performing individual. But, um, and the ones I was overqualified for, I was like, I don't really care. I just want a job right now. I just want to do something different. And uh, I wanted to get away from the dogs a little bit because I've been doing that my whole career. And it finally got to a point where I was like, well, I can't get a job, but my neighbor needs help with his dog. So I went over and helped him and he gave me a few hundred bucks. And I was like, for what? He's like, well, this other guy would have charged me 1200. And so I started doing more of that. We ended up looking at um, a school for training dogs um, to go to, even though I already knew how to do it. But I wanted to just kind of get do more, and the VA was going to pay for it. I went to a dog school, and while I was there, I asked my wife, like, hey, do you just want to sell our house in Virginia Beach, and we'll move in with your parents while we build a house down in Texas. And we ended up moving down to Texas, and I started my dog training business in my garage, which I saw pictures of that. Moved it to a 1,200-square-foot metal building. And then now we have a 10,000-square-foot facility where um, we also board dogs. And then um, 3,000 square feet of it is my new my new business where i um car dealer. So I love any type of car and, um, you know, try to find people a vehicle. So doing both of the things that I absolutely love to do. But, yeah, it was hard. So when you do that and you're kind of in charge for the first time in – your adult life you're kind of in charge of your own thing it's it's on you now to make the dog business work to make the yeah. the motor company work um does it feel good or does it feel like crazy pressure i don't feel any pressure none none even when even when one of my staff you know if they mess up and they do something wrong i don't you know i just i know if you own up for it and just you know do right what, what else is there? You know what I mean? Like not, there's nothing worse that can happen as long as you just own up for it. And, um, so no, I don't really feel any, I don't really feel any pressure. I mean, the car thing, like it was just an idea, like, Hey, I'm already going through all these different cars. I love cars. And, um, you know, if I can do it for somebody else and get them a good deal and do right by them and it's not going to break down, like that makes me feel great doing right by people. And, um, so no, no pressure. I mean, I guess if you think about it, the three cars I have sitting there right now, I mean, that's like $30,000 in inventory. That yeah. If it doesn't sell, like, but at the same time, I look at it this way, like, even if this thing were to fail right now, I could take those three cars now, because I sold one this weekend, and I could go bless some newly mom in need that, you know, is pregnant and needs a, needs a vehicle through the church. I could just go give it. And I'd be fine with that too. I mean, that's all. That's ultimately the ultimate goal is to do really well and and to have excess money to be able to bless people like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that. But I I I, I would go back though to, to where that would be pressure in itself. When you're always you know you can give that car away, but there's that pressure of of life and and it's amazing to hear people like you that just want to do the right thing because it yeah. doesn't it's it's not said a lot anymore now you also do hunts with veteran groups right that's how you met matt that's how i met matt yeah, yeah. so we get to go out um we do go out a couple times a year uh usually during veterans day we'll go do a, the hunt up here in dallas and which i know it's a, a game a ranch or whatever right but, um yeah you know, i got a buddy up in minnesota he's like that's not real hunting i'm like yeah i know but it's fun you know we it's get to, we, we look we look for you know, you, you go out and you shoot what you want to shoot, and then you drink beer with the guys. Um, and then the other the other one is uh, Bubba, who um, he owns a Treetops Lodge up in up in Alaska. He brings a bunch of us out every year, and I you know I 
I don't know if I was allowed to say his name, but the guy does a lot to, for us. And we'll go up uh, fishing up up there in Alaska and catch a can. Mm-hmm. And a uh, really great guy. And, you know, so it's great to be able to s- stay in and do that type, that type of stuff, especially with some of the same people. So do you think that, that um, with those things, that those are helping people? We've talked the whole time about mental health and stuff. Do you think that those kind of hunts and stuff – are really helping people because I think the the thing that you hear a lot of people say is, well, why would you put them out hunt and guns and stuff like that? And it's always been a dumb argument to me it because I, I think more than the guns and b- it's being with the boys again, like you said, it's being out, it's it's making a human connection, and it's always been a really dumb argument to me when people say that, like, well. If, if they're having problems with that, why would they go out and do that? And I'm like, because you're missing the whole point of it. Yeah. It's to be back with those guys again, whether that be, I mean, that's not even a real mission, but for that moment in time, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, some of these guys feel like, and, and girls, so I don't want to throw that out there. Like there's, there's female veterans out there that right. are struggling with the same shit. And I think some of them feel like, you know, like, like once you're out, the the train keeps moving. That's and, and it never looks back. And it never looks back. I actually just got a a Facebook message from a guy who went out to a um a seminar, and he's like, "Your name got brought up." He's like, "They still talk about the stuff you did," and I'm like, "Shit, man, I forgot." And I don't, I'm not one to like dwell on. Are they still talking about you? Are they? You know what I mean? Like I really don't care. Um, but when you hear it, and you're like, "Shit, maybe I did make an impact in somebody's life." I don't know. And um. You know, just going back to the different hunts and everything, you know, I I think it's great that there's a lot of things out there that veterans can do. And, um, you know, the one thing I will say, though, is, and this is to any veteran, you know, all, those, all that shit's great, but if you're not willing to help yourself, you'll never get better. A service dog, we'll, we'll just go talk about dogs. Service dog, if you're not willing to help yourself, that dog's going to die one day. And what are you going to do? You can go get another one. You can try. But if you're not willing to help yourself and get better mentally and 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 all of that, like, there's nothing in the world that's going to help you, you know, get there. Um, I'm just a strong believer. Like, if I didn't want to help myself, I would still be popping pills and I don't know what I, where I'd be right now, to be honest. Yeah, I, I think the problem, though, is – it's that that fear factor that we've talked about this whole time where they don't want to seem weak and to yep. say that something's wrong means that you're weak exactly and, and it's a it's it's a systemic problem i mean it's it's not going away it's it's not going to change no um and and i don't care about all this touchy feely stuff they're doing anymore where this it's almost like the winning hearts and minds where you you want to know yourself and stuff that they're not getting to the core of the problem though right. and especially with like you said with afghanistan just going back into the hands um a lot of guys are looking like well, what the fuck was all this for what yeah. what did i do all this for yeah. and then i get people that are you know i made some posts about it and you know people are like well don't make it political well i don't care who it would if it, if it would have been donald trump in office and this shit would have happened I'd have been just as pissed off. Like, it it doesn't, it's the fact that our government, it just makes you feel like they care so little about the sacrifice that was done over there. We're done. We've done what we've done and that's it. And I get that people have to fight for their own country, but I mean, we're still in Europe after 80, 80, 80 years. Yeah. You know, we're still over in Korea. I'm not saying you have to leave everybody there, but when we when we have left a contingent contingency there, like it's worked out. It's worked out. Like you want democracy to work, like that's how. I mean, you can't just leave it. Yeah, and and that's the whole thing is we, you you talk about over and over uh, making a democracy. Well, until you can change those thousands of years of not having a democracy it's not going to change into it you're not just going to go in there and force it to be a democracy it's not the crusades it's not anything like that where you're forcing the will on them they have to want to earn it they have to want to fight for themselves and and 
and until they can learn why it's, I, I think that's the, the kind of the piece that's missing is to know why it's important yeah. to have the democracy. Uh, because now you see women police officers, women judges over there, women, you know, all that's going to go away. Oh, again. It's, it's already you- starting to go away. I mean, women doctors and, you know, we, you know, we'd go on a couple missions in Afghanistan and I don't want to keep you, but we'd go out and the U we would build a brand new school. Like we would, I wouldn't, but we did. Right. U S did. And we're like, Oh, that looks cool. And then the next time we go out, cause you go in the same neighborhood, it's fucking bombed. Like, cause they don't want their, they don't want anyone learning. <laughs> no, yeah. No. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of them even said to me, like, you know, women are just for procreation. Like, okay. Like, if that's how you truly view, I mean, and, you know, you get people over here in the U.S. who have never been anywhere else. And um, they just don't realize, like, the, the liberties that are, like, you, like, <laughs> I mean, what they do to gay people over in Saudi Arabia and in the Middle East, like, I, it's fucking horrific is what it is, and no human being should be treated. I mean, I walked into um, a courtyard one time where the dude was chained up in a courtyard, and you're like, what, what, is, what is going on here? And this isn't a dog. You know what I mean? I don't know. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. You have a lot of people that haven't been anywhere or done anything in life, yet those people know how to e- either do your job better or know the better way to go, Yeah. even though they haven't seen another way. Like, they, they talk about things. Don't get me wrong. America is not perfect. No, we are not. By no means am I saying that. No. But check out some other countries and and see just how great they are over there. See how much you'll get to post on on Facebook or on Instagram about what you think the government is doing, yeah, or what you think is doing wrong. And I think a lot of people don't don't get that. So what's next for you, man? You, you're doing so many things. Yeah. So um, right now I'm right now I'm writing. So I've been writing that book for a couple of years. And if anybody's listening that knows a publisher that might want to take a chance. Um, I had one approach me a few years ago, but I stepped back from it. So I'm doing that. Um, I've got the, the dog training and, uh, what's a boarding facility. So we're taking dogs from all over the U S not just San Antonio. And then I've got the motor company, Patriot motor company. So, um, part of it is me buying cars and selling them. But another part of it is people reaching out and saying, Hey, I want this car and I can find them pretty much anywhere. Um, found a car for, for somebody in California and then we're going to ship it to Florida. Um, things like that. Like, I'm always open to do that. And people think like used cars, like they're thinking like beaters and stuff like that. And I'm talking like, you know, 2021 with, you know, 78 miles on it. That's considered a used car. And, um, you know, so I'm willing to do pretty much anything. And, um, you know, the dogs and cars have always been my thing. So I'm going to keep doing that. And, you know, if another opportunity comes by, I might might do it. You know, like I said, drive my drive my wife nuts. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I I love the uh, I love the car that you have on the Patriot Motor Company. So that uh, front page. So I sold that car to start the business. Really? I sold the GT five hundred to start that. Oh, it's beautiful. I've always wanted to drive one. It was amazing, and um, I'm sad that I I had sold it. But can we ask how much you sold it for? So that car, um, I, I bought it for 108 I only sold it for 105 I mean, because it depreciated a little bit. Right. But, but as a GT500 carbon fiber track pack, I mean, that thing was... Beautiful. Almost 800 horsepower. Damn. Yeah. So if you guys want to find him, and I think you should, PatriotMotorCompany.com is where they can find the vehicle stuff. And then, of course, we have the Patriot Dog Training at PatriotDogTraining.com. PatriotDogTraining.com has reservations, services. You have training, boarding, all those kind of things. And what areas can they cover for the boarding and stuff? Like, how far out would you? Oh, for, like, just bringing yeah, them like, for boarding. Yeah, like. So, for boarding, really, it's just people in the area. But right. for, like, the training part, like, if you wanted to send your dog for training, like, we take do- like we just had a dog go home that was with us for five months. Um, typically, people out of town, I recommend six weeks because it does take a little bit to get the dog to adjust by the time we get here and then get it back out to you. So, six to eight weeks, usually. 
And anything else that they can find on there? I know that there's a, a lot of different stuff that you can do on the site. The shopping, is that just getting like equipment and things Maybe like that? Maybe we sell t-shirts and leashes and stuff like that. I, I don't really push it, but our t-shirts are pretty damn soft, so they're pretty comfortable. Uh, and like I said, guys, go check this out. PatriotDogTraining.com, PatriotMotorCompany.com. Uh, I think that's going to be it. We went for quite a while. We went for we almost two and a half hours. Uh, guys, if you want more of me, you can find me on Instagram at DTD underscore podcast on Facebook at the DTD podcast and on YouTube where all these video versions of the conversations that we're having are, and that's at the DTD podcast. Also remember the best stories are true. That's why you come here every week. Cause we give them to you. Make sure you like subscribe, leave a comment for us. That helps us grow to get more people like Benny in here. Benny, thank you so much for coming in, telling your story. Um, I really was so excited to hear the opposite of what Eddie had said. And, and, and from a Good. different point of view, I think it was great. So that's going to be it for the show this week, guys. That's Benny. I'm DJ. This has been the show. We'll catch you on the next one. See you guys.